and we're live everyone it is 11 56 a.m central uh right here on this thursday march 7th rivian is slated to unveil their brand new uh more affordable really think about it as a model y type competitor a tesla model y type competitor a platform in its r2 platform super exciting for those that have followed the ev space this is a, a really cool day uh we're just waiting for Riving to go live they should go live here in, in the next four minutes if they're on time in the chat if you don't mind please do confirm that you can hear this little bit of chill yeah confirm that you can hear this because if you can, that means we'll be able to listen to what they have to say. <laughs> just checking to make sure that audio works. Uh, so we're just waiting for them to go live. Uh, again, this is a this is a pretty exciting day for those that follow the the, the EV space very closely. Uh, the R1T and the R1S lineup from Rivian is their larger, more uh, more luxurious, uh, a little bit more expensive lineup that has been very successful uh, in really making headway into the EV space. Uh, in my area, at least I'm in the Austin, Texas area, and I see a lot, a lot of R1Ss and R1Ts, a lot more than I did last year. Uh, if we take sort of think about what are the Teslas or what are the EVs that I see most on the road? Uh, Tesla's number one, obviously they've been around much longer. They have much larger scale and they have much more affordable products, but Rivian's number two. I see a lot of Rivian's around my area. So I'm very excited to see uh, what they have to unveil here. The By and large, people are expecting a more affordable platform with the R2. There were some specs that were leaked not that long ago where uh, the rumor is is that they're this Model Y competitor, this R1S or R2S potentially, it will start somewhere around the $47,000 range with, uh, with uh, specs that are very close to, if not a little bit better in some areas than the competing Model Y. Uh, and the same thing with potentially they'll release an R2S as well, which might be a smaller pickup truck. Now the R1 or R2T, excuse, me the r1t which is Ravian's pickup truck uh, right now is a little bit smaller than a than a standard f-150 the bet size for the r1t i believe is four and a half feet whereas the f-150 is five and a half feet and the cyber truck is about six feet and so this car actually is it's like they heard me this truck right there uh it's a little bit smaller than you would typically find in your standard say full-size uh pickup truck so releasing something smaller than this i'm curious to see if they'll actually do that because at that point you have a bed that's you know roughly potentially four to three and a half feet not really sure what what the usability is there but Another thing to remember is that Rivian is very much catering and marketing to a, a crowd that's a lot more outdoorsy, a lot more adventurous, uh, you know, off-roading and things like that. So that kind of customer base, I believe, uh, expects uh, a certain type of car that's maybe not your traditional F-150, maybe something that's a little bit more adventurous and more uh, that fits their needs. So we should be going live here in the next minute. Again, welcome in everybody. Make sure you can hear and see me okay. I believe we're all good on, on in all respects from that perspective. Yeah, and I'm curious to see what, what Rivian has up their sleeve here, man. This is going to be awesome. This is great for uh, the v EV space. Fantastic thing for competition, obviously. Uh, it's something that, you know, at least from where I stand, I see a lot of Teslas. I'm seeing a lot more Rivians and having uh, more competition between these uh, companies. I think it's going to be super healthy for the consumer and super healthy for both for both companies as well. Um, yeah, so I'm curious to see what they have. Uh, let me know in the comments what you guys expect to uh, to see from this uh, event as we gear up here. Yes, can hear. I got you on X picture in picture. Awesome, Daniel. Thank you for stopping in. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, curious to see what they have in the works, but honestly, it's years too late. I don't know if it's years too late. I mean, Rivian really hit the scene running in earnest about two years ago, and they've made a lot of headway. So it looks like they're right on time. Props to Rivian. Okay, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to put this on this and we'll listen to what they have to say. Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Rivian, RJ Scringe. Right on time.
Wow. <laughs> I'm so excited to have all of you here. Um, you know, this is a moment that's been building for so long for us and to have so many friends, family support, friends, family supporters that are here, it's like moving. I can feel it in my soul right now. So, so thank you guys. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot to talk about today. You know, I started Rivian and really at the core of it, every decision we make, the products, the strategy, what we're building, how we go about building our business, the way we structure our teams, the, the, the way we think about our culture has been built around this idea of keeping the world adventurous forever. And so much of that ties into this world of forever, or into this word of forever. And forever is, a, is an intimidating word. It's a word that means so many things, it's hard to even capture what that represents. And when we look at that word, when we think about what we're building, what we're creating, it extends beyond us, it extends beyond what we're doing today, what we're doing this month. And we often say we're building a world thinking about our kids, kids, kids. And it's our kids, 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 that mindset that informs how we make product decisions and it informs really importantly how we make the products what they are. So today, um, you know, when we think about that and we look at what we're gonna be, look, uh, we're gonna be showing you, just recognize the thoughtfulness that thousands and thousands of decisions have gone into those products. And to start that, we developed our R1 product line really as our handshake with the world. These are products that redefined what a truck was, what an SUV was, and enabled a level of performance, capability, everyday usability that really never before been seen. And that was built on this deep desire, this really deep desire to make products that not only enabled the types of ventures we want to take photographs of, the kinds of things we want to remember 20 years from now, 100 years from now, but also inspire those things, inspire you to say yes to things that scare you, to explore, to do new things. And that desire to explore feeds into all the things that we drive as a business. And hopefully you see that in our future products and what's to come. Now, beyond just the desire to explore, we also need to make sure that these products are safe. And a huge part of what we're building has been built around safety. In the R1 products, every decision that had to do with structure or the way the vehicle was packaged was laddering into the, the goal of making these not only a safe vehicle, but the safest truck and the safest SUV in the world. So the R1T and the R1S achieved that. Top Safety Pick Plus, the highest safety rating on the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, five-star standard, and they're incredible. Now, linked to all this is a technology platform we created. We built software, we built electronics, we designed entirely in-house a network architecture that allows our vehicles to get better and better over time. And I see a lot of our owners out here, and I know one of the things that's most followed is what's the next set of features to drop? And we get to make improvements to the software, we get to make, add new features, I get tons of feedback. You know, my dad will send me, whether he likes it or not, uh, sometimes very strongly worded. <laughs> but uh, we love the feedback. We love the opportunity to be really integral and connected to our community as we're making all these decisions. You know, we think about our community, we think about our owners. It's such a powerful part of what we're building. When I started, you know, I can remember back, it was, uh, we had all these things we'd wrote, we thought about what, what do we want to become as a company? And one of the things that inspired us so deeply was to say, can we create something that inspires people? It inspires us to behave differently. Desp inspires us to show up as our best self. And that was embodied in this goal of creating a, a movement or a community of users, a community of customers that just loved the product and had an orientation and optimism around the future that was so core to who we are. And there's so many ways to look at this. There's so many stories. I get lots of emails I love, I love sharing with the team. Emails from customers are doing really amazing things. So here's one that just embodies it beautifully. This is Milo. Imagine you're driving down the highway. You see a semi-truck in a ditch. <laughs> and you not only think to yourself, I'm gonna pull over and see if they're all right, I'm gonna try to pull them out of the ditch. <laughs> and so much in this embodies Rivian. It's, it's that orientation to help, 
but it's also the fact that the vehicle can pull a semi out of a ditch. Uh, and so I, 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 I used to get asked the question, can, can, a, can a Rivian vehicle tow? And I'd always jokingly say, can tow a house across the street? Just how far do you want to tow it? But um, you know, beyond the products and beyond what we're creating in the technology and the software and propulsion and towing capability, uh, is really the other element of, of how our brand manifests, which is our spaces. And we're sitting in one today. This is normally a movie theater. It doesn't look like one right now, but normally there'd be seats right here. Um, and this is an example of the types of spaces we want to create as a company. Spaces that are active elements of the community, pull people in, drive discussion, uh, enable the, the types of dialogue around what's coming in terms of electrification, what we have to drive in terms of change. Um, and this is one of many spaces. We're building more of these, and we have them across the US. And each one of these is special. Each one has some unique link to the community that it's in. And um, you know, these, are, these are a chance for us to physically manifest our brand in, in a very unique way. But beyond the, the spaces like this, we also have a whole network of service infrastructure we've created. And when we think about service, you know, your mind immediately goes to the idea of going to a physical service location. But actually, more than half of our service is done with our mobile service fleet. So we have over 500 mobile service trucks, our R1T, and mobile service vans uh, that actually show up at your house, show up at your work, and we can fix your vehicle there. But in addition to that, for things that we can't fix in your driveway or fix in a parking lot at your office, we do have a physical service infrastructure. We have 54 service locations today. These are rapidly ramping up. Uh, and, and these are beautiful spaces, enthusiastic team members, and we've just started doing test drives out of these to get more people exposure, not just to Rivian, but importantly to electrification and what it feels like to drive an electric vehicle, something that really completely changes the way you think about the way a car operates. So we wouldn't be talking about electric vehicles in this massive transition where we have to move one and a half billion vehicles in our global fleet over the next hopefully a few years, maybe a couple of decades, to electric without thinking about charging infrastructure. And one of the elements of charging that I, um, we often don't fully appreciate is most of it happens at home. More than 90% of your charging is happening actually in your garage. Uh, but you do need to go point to point. You need to go from Washington, D.C. to New York, from San Francisco to L.A. Uh, or if you don't have a garage, you need a way to charge your vehicles. So we're also building a high-speed charging network. We call it a Rivian Adventure Network. Uh, it's rapidly being built out. Uh, within a few years, we'll have 600 of these charging locations. And it'll be an open network. So it'll be Rivian vehicles as well as non-Rivian vehicles. And beyond that, we, of course, integrate across the other third-party platforms. And importantly, in fact, this month, our vehicles will be able to access the Tesla Supercharger Network. <laughs> and, that's for, and that's for existing customers. But I think we're going to see a big shift in the mosaic of charging solutions. And the technology and the platform we developed with, with our Rivian Venture Network is really key for that. Now, powering that network and powering this transition to, to electrification, we, th we can think about the end vehicle, the use of that vehicle as driving this change, driving a downstream demand shift from, of course, you know, gasoline or diesel to electric. But we also need to create the upstream supply of renewable energy. And this is an area we've been really focused on. And we're committed to building out over 7 billion miles of renewable energy by 2030. And so those projects are already underway. And the downstream demand that all of our customers, all of our owners collectively represent, enable us to create this new upstream supply of renewable energy. So we're here to talk about what's next. We're here to talk about how all this brings us to our next set of products, and, and really how we get a lot more people into our products, into our, into our brand. And how do we make Rivian more accessible to a lot more people? So with that, let me introduce you to R2. Hey, you ready?
Such a vibe about Rivian. <laughs> Miniaturized R1S, which is completely fine to be honest. I wonder what the got a nice roof. It's literally just a smaller R1S. <laughs> the music is amazing. <laughs> Dude, congratulations, Riven. This, this is fucking awesome. This is Jeff, awesome. our chief of design. That's uh, awesome. Jeff and the team have done just an incredible job of being the driving por force behind our products. Uh, we've been working together since well before the R1, so it is so amazing, Jeff, to see this, and to you and the team, amazing work. Thank you. So it is so awesome to show this. Uh, I've been waiting for this for a while. And there's a lot to talk about here. The, the vehicle combines capability, performance, utility, storage, functionality in a way that we think just really fits right into a, a huge customer need and a huge need within the market. The vehicle size, uh, the, the vehicle capability really has been optimized around enabling, as I said, and inspiring all those adventures. And so we're going to walk through the vehicle, but just starting here at the front, uh, in the front of the vehicle, we have a large front storage trunk. Uh, for those that are familiar with R1, of course, this should be uh, very relatable. But this is great for putting luggage, backpacks, your gear. Um, it's one of the most used storage areas for our R1 vehicle. We get to see the data on how all of our owners are using it. But it is just a, an awesome setup. And of course, this also serves to support a lot of the front safety in the vehicle in terms of the, the crash structure that you saw in those R1 videos. Now, if we go around the side of the vehicle, uh, it's, it's hard to see without sitting in it, but so much effort has gone into making sure the packaging, not just in the front row, but also in the second row, creates this really airy, really comfortable, really spacious experience. Something that um, really is world class. There's nothing quite like it in this size of vehicle where you get in and you feel so comfortable and it feels so inviting. Uh, and we're gonna take a look at the interior in a second. But first, just walk around the back. We did a lot of work to create something that builds a really open air experience. And you just saw, or maybe you saw, these quarter windows pop out. And what that does is we leverage the negative pressure off the back of the vehicle uh, to pull natural air through. And it creates this beautiful open air feeling experience. And then the rear glass, which you just saw drop, also opens. And now the rear glass opening, it, it literally feels like an open air experience. But this gives you an ability to put. That was awesome. This, this, you could put surfboards, you can put longer gear. Uh, and as you just saw, the second row seats fold flat, but also the first row seats fold flat. And the first row seats folding flat. Camping. That gives you, when, you know, if you're driving the vehicle, you can put long things in very easily. But if you're not driving the vehicle, let's say you're camping or staying right in the vehicle, it creates this awesome in-vehicle really camping smart. experience really with smart. an inflatable mattress. Um, so walking around here to the side, you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, what's, how does the vehicle size? You're probably looking at me. I'm about six foot one, trying to figure out how does this compare to an R1. Well, we'll, we'll tell you it's about 400 millimeters shorter than an R1S. And uh, in addition to being shorter, it's quite a bit uh, or shorter in wheelbase. It's also lower in height. Uh, and it makes it, it fits into any garage. It fits into tight spaces, really maneuverable. 
but to look at it in a driving environment is really helpful. So we'll show you it here next to an R1S. It looks awesome. It looks really <laughs> like, you know, just you know, two family members out for a stroll. Significantly smaller. I love that. Um, so let's take a look at the inside. And there's, uh, when we think about the design of an inside of an interior of the vehicle, uh, a lot of that ties to just what's in the, um, what's in the materials, what's in the packaging, what does it make you feel? What's that environment feel like? And so we spent a lot of time working through those materials and the overall packaging to create an experience that is as inviting as, as one could imagine. And we have a lot of feedback from R1. And one of the points of feedback was a desire for a glove box. And we, we had lots of reasons to not have one. Two of them. <laughs> but on, on, on R2, we over-delivered, and we put two glove boxes in. The other thing, I mean, there's lots to see here, but the, one of the things that's so, so exciting is the way we've looked at the controls. And we have these really nice, large wheels and the uh, scroll wheels and the steering wheel. There's dynamic haptic, haptic feedback. So it allows us to adjust what it's feeling like when you're scrolling, and it's, it's magical. It takes our existing scroll wheel and really up-levels it to a degree that's hard to fully appreciate unless you're sitting in the car. Now, jumping back out, uh, a lot of work went into the doors. Too. Move the speaker out of the door, gives us space for a large water bottle here. And of course, it wouldn't be a Rivian if I have a flashlight in the door. So, really love that. Super handy. Um, so now, how, how does this set up in terms of how it functions? And we built an entirely new platform to underpin this vehicle. Uh, a lot of work went into driving manufacturing cost efficiency. And it's built around a, a 4695 cell. So 40, it's a cylindrical cell, 46 millimeters in diameter, 95 millimeters tall. It's a much larger cell than the 21 millimeter diameter uh, cell that we have in, in R1 today. And that cell's integrated into a highly structural battery pack. So the battery pack in the floor actually makes up a, a big part of the vehicle structure. The top of the battery pack is actually the floor of the vehicle. So a lot of these innovations that we're driving into how we build the vehicle are you know, core to us making sure the price point can be really affordable. We'll get to that later. Um, but at the, from a drivetrain point of view, oh, we have a single motor, rear wheel driver variant. We have a dual motor, one motor in the front, one motor in the back, all wheel drive variant. And then we have a tri-motor, two motors in the back, one in the front. And in the highest performance variants of the vehicle, zero to 16, well under three seconds. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's very quick. Um, and then all those motor combinations uh, can achieve over 300 miles in range. Awesome. So, so much, so much of what a Rivian is, is, is capturing the dynamics of the vehicle. And we, we needed to make sure that all the decisions we made in the aggregate, the suspension, the drivetrain, the battery positioning, the packaging of the vehicle, delivered something that drove like nothing else. Something that was exciting on-road, something that was incredibly capable off-road, but had the everyday refinement and usability uh, to work if you're parking it in San Francisco or driving it in New York. And so that focus on dynamics is so embedded in, in our culture as an organization uh, and embedded, of course, into our products. Now, we talked about the vertically integrated electronics we built that enable this amazing software platform that we've seen in R1. We take that even further in R2. Uh, we talked about how the packaging and the design of the, the structure allows us to achieve really amazing, uh, you know, amazing manufacturability. But we've all, also focused a lot on sensors and the compute in our vehicle. And this has 11 cameras, five radars, you know, four radars in the corner, one long range radar in the front which we couple with our new, much higher compute platform, which will enable this to, enable this to have a very high level of self-driving. And for us, that represents being able to get on the highway, take your hands off the wheel, eyes off the road, and, and truly operate it where you get your time back. And that's, um, I, 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 our, to our self-driving team, we're, we're really excited about what this vehicle represents uh, for us. 
Now, um, I do want to talk just a bit about how we uh, laid out the manufacturing system here. And I talked before about battery pack, but every single decision in a vehicle, and I say this a lot, uh, you look at a vehicle in the aggregate like this and it, it looks like oh, maybe there was a few thousand decisions. There's millions of decisions that have to be made across thousands of engineers. And those thousands of engineers making those collectively millions of decisions were incredibly focused on ensuring every one of those is not only optimizing for, for what the ownership experience will be, but optimizing our ability to make this very affordable and very accessible. And so the R2 starting price will be $45,000. Nice. Estimated, but we'll, yeah, 45. With a tax credit? And you can reserve one starting today. Already got mine! Yes! <laughs> I love that. I'm so excited about this vehicle. Uh, I'm so excited about what it represents for us as a company in terms of achieving scale, what it represents for us in terms of our collective learning being embodied into one vehicle as the, you know, the follow product to what we did with our flagship product with R1. But it's important to note, R2 represents not just a vehicle, but it also represents a platform. And that platform, as I said, the performance, the capabilities, but also the flexibility from a manufacturing point of view is really important for us. And I'm really, really excited to talk about R2's sibling. What? which we call R3. Oh boy, what is this? Pick up. Compact. What is this? Like a, yeah. That's awesome. Good for Rivia, man. Looks like they got a compact car coming out, too. Holy shit, that's awesome. So you didn't expect that one more thing here. So R3 is, we're so excited about what this sort of delivers beyond what we see in R2. It's, it takes the package of R2 and the platform, it shrinks it, it puts it into our take on what is a crossover. Um, and it's a vehicle that's almost hard to define what it is, but it so beautifully captures our brand, it captures what we represent as a company. Uh, it's dynamically incredible, the shorter wheelbase, the tighter dimensions, uh, really enable it to be something that's you know, maneuverable and drivable. But as tidy as it is on dimensions on the outside, we put so much effort into making sure that the inside feels big. And uh, much like we saw on, on R2, uh, there's a lot of work that went into everything that you see in the rear of the vehicle, the, the occupant areas in the front of the vehicle. But this is all enabled by the platform. And it's about five inches shorter, 135 millimeters shorter than what you see in R2 in terms of wheelbase but leveraging all that same content. So the single motor, the dual motor, and a tri-motor, the beautiful battery pack built around a, a larger format cell, our network architecture, uh, really excited about that. Oh, hello. Um, so up front, we have a front storage trunk, much like what we had in R2. And that storage area of the vehicle, uh, you can use to throw all your gear, your bags, and something like this, wonderful for, for that everyday urban usability, uh, adventure usability. But I want to spend some time in the back. And we spent so much time as a team thinking about working on how do we create a unique closure experience in the back. And what you just saw happen is the rear lift gate came up. Um, just like we saw in R2, the first and the second row seats fold flat. Uh, so it creates a, an opportunity for in-car camping or it creates an opportunity to carry your long gear. Uh, but when we close this, there's a second way to get to the back, which we call our flipper glass. And 
What I love about this is it makes it easy to get things in and out, but this actuation can actually go to multiple heights. So if you're carrying something that's longer, that could be a surfboard, it could be stuffed animals, it could be a trombone. Um, <laughs> you can adjust the height here, and it's a, it's a user setting to make it really easy to carry those bigger objects or bigger things around. And you know, as I said, everything in, as we thought about this vehicle was around making a, a smaller car, car feel really big. Now, looking at the interior, a lot of what we saw on the, um, you know, on the R2 carries over here. So the use of materials, the way we think about the sustainability of those materials, how durable they are, uh, and, and really embodying that Rivian feel is, is driven into this. And I wish you could all sit in the car right now. But it, um, same thing we, we had with R2 with the control wheels and the steering wheel. Lots of flexibility in terms of storage, two glove boxes, um, <laughs> and of course, we still have a flashlight here. Those glove boxes, man. I'm impressed. This is this is a this is really smart of Rivian, and I'll explain why once they're once they're done. Now, we talked about platform flexibility. Hopefully, you're seeing that here between R2 and R3. Uh, the ability for these these two vehicles with really common family genes. You can feel their siblings. They look like the Rivians. They feel like the Rivians. Unfortunately, you can't all drive them to say they drive like the Rivians, but I can guarantee you they do. Um, but there's one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. R4. And looking at R3, we wanted to take everything that's embodied and put it into an even higher performance package. And this is something we call R3X. Probably like an Abarth type. Uh... Dude's shirt. <laughs> what? I mean, I, this is just so cool. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is the vehicle when we walk around in the studio, everybody sees it and they're like, oh, I want that so bad. Um, and I, I think you know, that happens for anybody that sees it. But this captures, as you can see, R3, but pulls a level of like, deep, deep performance capability into it. And there's lots of subtle differences. It's a wider wheel and tire, a little wider stance, more ground clearance tri-motor setup, um, and a focus on really taking the, the capabilities of, of what Rivian represents and, and really flexing that and really showing that. And, and a small car, small, smaller crossover, uh, delivering a level of on and off-road performance that, um, that will get us all very excited. Um, and what you can't see, and I want to show, is the interior on the vehicle is just beautifully laid out. Uh, we, we had a chance to really stretch ourselves uh, this is an interior combination we internally call rugged playful because it looks rugged and it looks playful. Uh, but the use of materials and the use of how we laid out those materials with cork and with interesting weaves and interesting ways to anodize metal, uh, it feels so uniquely Rivian but also so unique to this vehicle and, and to the performance variant. Now, <clears throat> as we think about this portfolio of vehicles, R2, R3, R3X, uh, I can see from the room everyone is excited. We are. We are so excited. These, and these, these represent our future. These represent what we've been building to, the, the brand that we established with the R1 products and, and positioning Rivian to take that further and make that more accessible to more people. And we've been working hard to find ways to pull the timing on these programs forward, to get them to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And with that, I'm excited to, to, to say that we're going to be pulling the timing in 
to allow R2 to start deliveries in the first half of 2026. And, and, we're, and we're able to do that, we're able to achieve that, that accelerated timing by leveraging our production capabilities in normal. Using, using, using our Illinois site to launch R2 and get that into market as quickly as we can. Now, our Georgia site remains really important to us. It's core to the scaling across all these vehicles between R2, R3, R3X, and we're so appreciative of all the partnership we've had there. But being able to leverage the team, the skill, the passion we have in our Illinois facility to get that into the market, to get that to customers, some of those orders I heard over there, as quickly as possible, we are, we are just ecstatic about. Now, hopefully you see, when we look at our products, when we look at R2, when we look at R3, when we look at our, at R3X, every decision, as I said, ties to making sure these vehicles enable and inspire the kinds of things we want to take photographs of, the kinds of things we want to remember 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And so we've also developed a set of accessories that sit on these products. Yes. <laughs> that, that link to making and building those memories. So we have a tent that's so beautifully integrated that goes onto the top of R2 or R3. Uh, we have bike racks that make the use of bikes really easy. We want all of our vehicles to be the easiest vehicle to go biking with. Um, and we have a really clever way to think about a kitchen and rear storage plugging into our storage ports in the back of the vehicle. But ultimately, we as a company, we as Rivian, we exist to not only help transition a world away from combustion fuels and into electrification, we exist to help generate amazing memories in the process of doing so. I'm very impressed by the R3. Curious on the timeline and the price. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today to hear about our future. We couldn't be more excited. Okay. If you're a fan of Rivian, this is probably one of the best uh, things you've seen from the company surprising wise, if I were to guess. <laughs> Great. Wonder if there's anything else coming up. Probably not. That's probably it. Okay. All right. Good job, Rivian. That was freaking awesome. Okay. Awesome. So, if you're joining us live, thank you so much. We have about 3,800 folks joining us between X and YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me go ahead and bring myself up here. I'll keep an eye open and see if there's anything else going on, but I believe that's it. Okay. So, we've seen some pretty exciting stuff from Rivian today. Uh, we, we saw their much-rumored R2 product finally unveiled with a starting price of $45,000. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can pull up their reservation page and so we can look at that together here. Uh, let's see. Stop screen. And then let's go ahead and share screen of Reserve Rivian. Let's go right there. Perfect. Okay. So if we go to their page. Okay. So they have a $100 um deposit if you want to uh place an order for an r2 estimated delivery is 2026 you can put your name in and they said the starting price is forty five thousand dollars but i'm not really seeing a breakdown of the actual um trims so we don't know if it if they have a you know what what the starting trim is what the middle trim is and what the uh, higher end trim uh, they have. But what, what they did say 
is that Rivian will have uh, the R2 will have a uh, sort of a real wheel drive, a dual motor drive and a performance variant, which is a tri motor drive. The performance variant is going to have uh, a less than uh, three seconds, zero to 60, uh, which if I look at, let's say if we look at uh, their direct competitor for the R2, I would probably say is something along the lines of a Model Y if you're looking at an electric version. And if we look at the pricing for the performance variant for the Model Y, uh, it's a 3.50 to 60 and a 285 mile range. Uh, model long, Y long range is 310, 4.80 to 60, and Model Y rear wheel drive is $44,000, 260 miles. Riven claims that they can get their uh there are two or yeah are two there are really so many models today i don't even know what i'm talking about anymore there are two will start all the variants will start at at least 300 miles um but it doesn't look like they have all the variants listed on here yet which is obviously i guess it's it's up to them to decide if they want to do that or not so uh i'm very i'm very fascinated by that by that by that release i really am some thoughts off the top of my head here is that the R2 was something that was rumored for Raven to release for, for a little while now. Between the R1S and the R1T, which is their existing lineup, if we go to the website real quick, if you're not familiar with the brand, uh, we can look at it together. Uh, let's go ahead and go here. So the R1T is their pickup truck uh, that they have with a four and a half foot bed. It looks like if you want to pick up, this is the only form factor you're going to be able to get it from Rivian. They're not going to have any anything smaller, which I think makes sense. Somebody mentioned in the comment section below that uh, the Maverick, the Ford Maverick is a smaller form factor than this, and that one's selling really well. Uh, I 100% agree, but I think for the use case for, for that car in this form factor as an electric vehicle, maybe it doesn't make sense right now. But this is the R1T. If you want a large SUV, they have the R1S, which is uh, sort of think of it as a Model X or a Kia EV9 is probably a better uh, comparison to that one. Three rows, front trunk space, back trunk space. This one's really popular right now in Ravens lineup. If you want a sort of a mid-size, smaller SUV, uh, in a, it's, it's hard to tell what the packaging looks like in, say, comparison to a Model Y. We'll do a little bit of a deep dive here in a second. But if you want sort of that mid-size SUV, a little bit smaller SUV, you can put in your reservation today for 100 bucks, And then the deliveries start in 2026, which is roughly two years from now. And then they had a third car that they showed, which was the R3, which was a compact form factor. But we got very little details on the Rivian R3. Um, my guess is, my guess is the R2 is a lot more for customers and the r3 is probably geared more for investors and the reason why i say that is if we think about where rivian is from a financial perspective they they are a very successful company from a from a product perspective but the one thing that they have to do yet is reach profitability and the r2 is going to help them with that tremendously because they'll be able to reach a lot higher scale they just got to reach that point to be able to to do that um i don't know if they're going to raise capital or they're going to be able to become profitable with their current lineup but that's the that's rivian's biggest challenge here so the r2 is very much that and i think the r3 is that vision that's telling everybody out there and, and i think investors as well in rivian that says, hey, we're not stopping here. We have yet another leg of growth after that that's going to come from this uh, smaller car. They didn't say when or how much, but if I were to assume, it's probably going to start somewhere around the $30,000, $35,000 range, maybe lower, but I'm going to guess thirty to 35000 And knowing that the R2, which is their midsize SUV, is going to start at um, forty five dollars and won't start until 2026, we probably don't expect that R3 smaller version probably won't come out until like 2027, 2028, 2027 at the earliest. I don't think that they'll they'll do that in, in parallel uh, because otherwise they would have said otherwise I think they would have said something unless they're looking to surprise people. But ramping for Rivian, I think ramping one car, the R2 is going to be challenging enough because they, they have to get to profitability. So it was really interesting to hear them say anything about the R3, but it, it really, it really sounds like 
they are they're signaling to the people that are saying, hey, we're going to be around for a while, y'all. So we're just you're just going to have to be patient with us from a profitability perspective to investors. But we're going to get there. If you're a fan of the cars, this is probably a fantastic freaking day because they I mean, every owner that I've talked to from that, that owns a Rivian loves their car and, and for right reasons, they have great products. They really, really do. And with the R2, they're going to be able to cater to a much broader clientele, uh, uh, something where they can actually, you know, afford that car. Not sure what the EV tax credit looks like at that point, because there is a $7,500 EV tax credit. And I believe Rivian right now gets, I can't remember if they get full or half. I want to say they get, I want to say they get um, EV credit 2024. I want to say they get half the credit, but let me go ahead and uh, confirm that from IRS, federal EV credit. Let's go to here. You guys can watch along with me. We're going to go to where's that stupid link? OK, here we go. And then if we put in a delivery date of January 1st, 2024, and we're going to look at Rivian, Rivian. Yeah, they get half the credit. They got 3750. So curious to see when the R2 and the R3 sometime down the road get released, if this EV credit still in and you know, in existence, are they going to get the full amount or half of the amount? Um, so I'll be interested to see. The other thing that, that was mentioned on the stream was that Rivian's coming out with a, for their R2 platform, which again is this um, mid-size SUV uh, vehicle, still we don't have all the, all the details for it that you can you know, reserve for a hundred bucks and it starts in 2026. Uh, it uses a structural battery pack and a 4695 cell which is interesting because uh, it sounds very similar to what Tesla is doing with their uh, structural battery pack and their 4680 cell. The 4695, I maybe they're designing their own cell as well, but I, I, I doubt that they will be doing that where they can just tap into the supply chain for the 4680. Tesla's not the only one that's leveraging that battery platform. It's a bunch of other uh, third parties are doing that as well. Uh, and somebody's saying it's 50 millimeters longer that could be the case. Maybe it's not that difficult to do that from a manufacturing perspective, but uh, they're also going to do the uh, the structural battery pack. So it's something where it's going to allow them to essentially cut down a bunch of materials and leverage the structure of the vehicle on the on the on the bottom side to make that a floor for the car, as well as give it a bunch of rigidity and uh, weight savings and all that stuff. And it's interesting to see another manufacturer going down the path of structural battery pack and sort of that 4680, 4695, what they're calling architecture, sort of like a validation that says, hey, this is the way electric vehicles are going. So it was very, very interesting there uh, to hear that from Rivian. Um, and then the other really important thing that I heard from this is that the R2 platform uh, for the car that's supposed to be shipping starting in 2026, uh, this $45,000 midsize compact SUV uh, sort of form factor, We'll have 11 cameras and, and, and five radars. Yeah, 11 cameras and five radars. And from what I heard from the CEO of Rivian, RJ, they're trying to have a, essentially a system where when you're on the highway, you can take your hands and eyes off the road and the car will just take you from point A to point B on the highway, right? Just the highway, what I heard anyway, and so that you can get your time back. And this sounds to me a lot like a level three driving system that's specifically for the highway, which is interesting to hear that they're not going the pathway of, let's say, a, a Tesla or a uh, or all these other, you know, x -Bang out in China. They're they're not trying to go for the full level four route, which would be just fully autonomous anywhere. But instead, they're going with a level three system that will allow the, the person to take their eyes, basically stop paying attention to the driving for some portion of their drive. Uh, and this is about two years down the road. So depending on what the, you know, developments are with self-driving technology, like let's say if Tesla is able to achieve level four by then with their existing full self-driving system, um, does that put Rivian at a disadvantage versus Tesla? Probably. But does it put it at a disadvantage versus gas cars? Absolutely not. And I think that's what's very interesting about the positioning here for Rivian is that oftentimes when you think about the EV market, you know, it's easy for us to say, oh, it's Tesla versus Rivian. It's BYD versus Tesla. It's x versus freaking Baidu, 
or whatever. You know, it's it's Volkswagen versus uh, Volkswagen EV or Ford EV versus Rivian. It's not really. It's EV versus gas car. And so I think as long as Rivian can offer a product that is significantly better than their competing gas cars, they're going to do extremely well in the long term. But they also have to keep in mind that if if they have technologies like that self-driving system, if a competitor has a alternative that does work anywhere, then they have to think about the implications of that. But you also can say, hey, there's a bunch of people out there that are just not going to trust the self-driving technology nearly as much, and they value what Rivian has better than Tesla. And then, of course, that makes sense. But then the question becomes, are those people enough people to get Rivian to profitability, right? Just how I'm thinking about the Rivian story. So sick, sick, dude. It actually, it, I'm very excited. It works, Nate. Good job. <laughs> Nate works for X. Shout out, Nate. Okay, let me hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Let's do a little bit of a, of a, you know, hear what people have to say. I do wish if there's one thing I wish Rivian did, which again, I don't fault them for doing this because the car is still two years away from being delivered. They're clearly early stages in getting this thing ranked up, ramped up. Um, what I'm really curious to see here, I completely turned my, lost my train of thought. Comments, please, in the, in the, <laughs> let me know what comments you have. <laughs> Great job, Farzad. You're such a good host. My God. Uh, from Cash, Rivian beat Tesla to EV truck, uh, have more companies buying their commercial fleet than Tesla and are going to beat Tesla to compact car. Yeah, this is, so Rivian definitely beat Tesla to the EV truck, uh, have more companies buying their commercial fleet for sure with the vans and are going to beat Tesla to compact car. That That's a, um, I don't know about that, mainly because the R2 is slated to come out in 2026 and I highly, highly doubt the R3, which is that compact car, a compact form factor will be anywhere close to 2026 uh, because they have to get the R2 ramped first and try to get to profitability consistently and positive cash flows, basically get the company to make money before they before they get the R3 ramped. The, and the key reason why I say that is because to get products out into the world, especially if you're a car company, the amount of cash and resources and work that you need to get those products to become profitable and not lose money for the company takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. And, and and so if I use the example of Rivian, uh, Rivian Investor Relations, uh, Rivian's in a, in a very interesting spot right now because even though their products are extremely good, and honestly, RJ seems like a great CEO. He's at least a very good public speaker. And um, great fashion sense. Those pink shoes were actually freaking fire. <laughs> I was shocked at how good he was freaking uh, pulling off the, the pink shoes. Honestly, I'm not even saying that like in any form of like any diss. I was legitimately impressed by how well he put that that drip, that drip together, as they say. Um, I'm so lame. So <laughs> here's a focus on gross, gross profit and, uh, and cost efficiency. So what Rivian's uh, fighting through right now is that in Q4 2022, they were losing about $124,000 per car. Then through the course of a year up through the third, fourth quarter of 2023, they were able to reduce their fixed cost, basically the cost that pertain to building a car that is um, that doesn't really vary as you push more cars to the factory. They were able to reduce that by 45%. And then they were able to reduce their variable costs, which is the costs that do fluctuate depending on how many things you push to the factory. This is like a very big oversimplification, but that's kind of how it works. They were able to reduce that by 40%. And then they were able to uh, reduce uh, that the cost again by leveraging revenue per unit, basically pricing by another 15%. And it got them to the point by now, right now, they're losing about $43,000 per car on gross profit. So when they manufacture a car, they it cost them, I don't know, it cost them 120,000 and they sold it for 80. That's just a good way of thinking about it. So they have a $40,000 gap. Now Rivian thinks for the, for the rest of the year, so all the way to Q4 of 2024, they're going to be able to reduce variable and fixed costs by 50% and 35% and do another revenue per unit adjustment, which they're essentially saying they're going to try to raise prices. It's what I'm getting from this to try and get to positive gross profit, meaning like, hey, we're going to at least get to 1% gross profit. But that's another $43,000.
this curve happens because they have to go from zero to basically 15 to 20,000 units that they're selling per quarter right now. And when you start at zero with a new car, so when they start at zero with the R2, uh, yeah, the R2, they're going to be in this situation where those cars are going to be losing a ton of money until they get to a certain level of scale and cost efficiency to make more money on those cars. And Rivian is going to start incurring costs for that probably since it begins in 2026. They're going to start putting in money into their factories, into their processes, sometimes starting next year in earnest. And then for all of 2026, R2 is going to cause a sort of something similar to this on top of them trying to get to profitability with R1T and R1S, which is their pickup and their SUV. So it's really important for Rivian to get those two things, R1T and R1S, to profitability so they, they don't have two things losing money, right? Because the R2 will lose money for a significant period of time until they can get it to scale. So that's their challenge. I mean, that's just their business challenge, right? The product is great, obviously, but that's their business challenge. And then if you put R3 on top of that, they can't really do R3 I would think, unless they're able to, this is where it gets interesting, unless they're able to raise a lot of cash so that they have a ton of runway to do R3 in parallel, or Apple buys them, right? Somebody buys them and becomes their sugar daddy of, of sorts, which is a fantastic strategy, honestly. Honestly, like Apple should maybe start thinking about buying Rivian, to be completely honest. But especially since they ab abandoned their uh, their EV plants, but just, just speculation. Just to give you a little bit of context, it's releasing a car, especially an EV with a supply chain that still needs to be developed. So costs are very, very tight for these companies. It's a very difficult thing to do, but it seems like Rivian has the product. It ha they have the portfolio to do it. They just need time and money and it we'll see if they have time and money. So, and I'm curious to see how the R2 will impact the R1 sales too. I think it will have us, I don't think it will really hurt R1S sales that much because R1S, their large SUV is significantly bigger than the R R2, um, which is very smart of them to do. So, uh, Juan, thank you so much for the super chat. How are they going to produce all those vehicles? Time and money, time and money. You know, they, they've proven that they can do the R1S and R1T they can put good products out there, not profitable yet, but time and money. Uh, why is Rivian not taking uh, talking about engineering? So I think what's interesting, that's a fascinating question. And I think that's probably from somebody who is a, a, uh, a big fan of, of, of Tesla. Tesla has this mantra. It's like they're like, if you look at their events and you look at how they unveil products, if you view them through the lens of like a typical car company or just a typical company in period, you look at them and be like, that's the, that's the worst marketing thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you have a CEO as charismatic and as lovable as he can be, not the greatest public speaker, and they focus so much on the detail and the science and the engineering of their product. But that's what Tesla is. The Rivian, you can see, is a lot more polished. They're a lot more conscious of how their customers view them. They want to make you feel something. You know, they want to make you, they want to connect with you in a, in a, in a tribal sense to like your senses and your sense of adventure. I mean, you, it's such a wonderful case study to take Rivian's presentation style and Tesla's presentation style, put them side by side. And it's the, the contrast between the two, those two things are insane. And so you can see they're just two different, completely different ethos, completely different companies, but they work, right? Uh, but that's why it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I think it's just people who really appreciate engineering, appreciate engineering. Typically, they look at a presentation in Rivian and be like, okay, what are you talking Like, Just tell me, tell me how you came to the uh, structural battery pack. Tell me how you designed the 4695 cell. How did you design your crumble, th crumple th zones? You know, how did you design your drivetrain? Talk to me, talk to me about the engineering. Whereas Rivian is probably like, well, that's probably going to bore our customer base. So we're just going to, and it's not right or wrong. It's just probably truth. Let's talk to them about what they appreciate, you know? So it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful case study in how companies decide to show themselves to the public. And my argument for Tesla 
if I were to argue on their behalf, is like they don't even care. <laughs> they don't even care how they appear in front of uh, the customer. They're just going to focus on the hardcore engineering because they believe as long as we've got a great product, people will buy it. You know, and Rivian definitely has the same sort of vibe. They make great products, but they're much more conscious about how they are viewed by the public. And they're also very big in driving that um, sustainable energy ethos like Tesla is as well, which is really, really cool to see. If you're into that, you know, Rivian's very good at that. Let's see what other comments we have. Uh, this is an interesting comment. Uh, Rivian presentation looks a lot like a Bose sound system presentation. They focus on pureness, nature, emotions. Yeah, I agree 100%. They have a very, a very unique way of carrying themselves. And I really appreciate that. And it, it makes me feel good. I felt good watching the Rivian presentation. I'm like, ooh, maybe I should get a Rivian. <laughs> they do a great job. They really do, man. Fantastic company. And it really showcases... For those that I think are paying attention to the EV space, it again showcases just how far electric vehicles have come to the point where you can have a legitimate company releasing a legitimate product or unveiling a legitimate product that people are going to be excited about that's an electric vehicle. That is still insanely underappreciated, especially in the world where the best selling car in the world is an electric vehicle in the Model Y, which sold 20% more than the runner up, which was the Corolla at twice the average selling prices. So it costs twice more to buy a Model Y than a Corolla on on average. It was sold in a lot less markets than the Corolla was. It was barely marketed or advertised. And it's an electric vehicle only. It's an EV only car. That explains the times as well as anything, I, I believe. Uh, Rivian has good people and a unique style. I always thought of them as the new Land Rover for the future. Man, I love that comparison because it really, Land Rover's thing is like, you know, we're here. It's like a mix of luxury and adventure. And that's kind of what Rivian's going for, luxury and adventure. It's just in an EV format. And it seems a lot more approachable. It's like um, it has a tech sort of angle as well. It's a lot more modern, whereas Land, Lo Land Rover, right or wrong. And I'm sorry for stereotyping here. For those that own a Land Rover, I love you. It feels like an old money brand. <laughs> whereas Rivian feels like a like a new money like a new money brand, right? But it's got that cool adventure, hip, you know, artsy fartsy sort of vibe, which I, I love, honestly. As an art, artsy fartsy guy, I approve, okay? Um, uh, thanks, Faza, for giving Rivian their flowers. Last year, no one was even doing a live stream for Rivian. Of course, man. I mean, listen, I, for those that follow me closely, you know that I, I, I'm a huge fan of Tesla. I've been following that, that story for a long time. But uh, I, I make a big effort in ensuring that I'm not putting myself in a freaking echo chamber of sorts. And Riven is a company that I've always admired and I thought their products were great. I have questions about their viability, li viability long term if they can't reach profitability, obviously, because you can't be a business unless you, you're profitable. But yeah, man, you can't deny Rivian that Rivian is doing a phenomenal job getting a product that people love. And that is like the most important step in having a successful company, then you got to figure out how to make that profitable. So um, it's cool. Uh, Apple should have just bought Rivian. Dude, I this is super speculation and don't take my word for it. You're not allowed to dunk on me at the end of the year if this becomes false. OK, I'm just throwing it out there. One has to wonder if the move by Apple to cancel their EV plans is a signal that says, why should we make our own EV when we can just buy one of these other EVs, EV companies? And in the case of Rivian, what's their biggest need right now? It's getting surviving to the point where they can get R2, which is that mid-sized compact SUV looking thing, not the R3, but the R2. It's still tough to tell what the dimensions are exactly, but probably mid-sized getting surviving to R2, surviving through R2, and then hopefully they're profitable and have positive cash flow by then. And then they tackle R3. And then Apple might be looking at that and be like, okay, so how much cash do they need? Probably, probably 10 to $20 billion to be safe, to get to probably $20 billion to get to R3 at scale. Rivian's like, bro, we generate so much cash, we literally don't know what to do with it. 
why not just buy them? Why not just buy them, give them the cash they need, we'll put our software expertise in the car, we'll make Rivian an Apple ecosystem vehicle, we'll put Siri in there, we'll put everything, right? And then as level three driving comes to fruition for them on the highway, maybe people can start, you know, using watching Apple TV, you know, on the on the on the car. Maybe they'll start using our apps, you know, maybe they'll freaking play Fruit Ninja on the screen or whatever. Right. And then if they reach level four, which doesn't look like it's even remotely in their plans to reach level four, but level four, again, is like fully self-driving. Uh, where you don't have to pay attention anywhere. Level three is where you don't have to pay attention in certain situations, and Rivian looks like they're driving it as a highway solution. In that situation, does Apple become the software driver, it, like the in in car entertainment, and then Rivian just focuses on just getting these things to be profitable and out the door? I don't know. And I feel like an Apple logo will look pretty good on a Rivian. It kind of like fits the vibe too. Like it would replace the Rivian logo with an Apple logo. But honestly, if Rivian can make this on their own and get there to where they need to be without getting purchased, more props to them. You know? Uh, interesting. So Rivian is basically useless to Apple as they don't have good self-driving tech. By the way, Tim Cook has talked about autonomy and ride sharing. It was very important to their project. Yeah, it may have been important to their project, but they canceled it for a reason. Right? And if it's still something that they're... You know, it, it might still be something that they're looking at, but them canceling the EV plan essentially defaults to them either providing the self-driving tech or being in a car, let's say an exclusive car with their tech that has their vision and they partner with somebody else with the self-driving tech. Tesla at that point, again, if they solve level four with FSD version 12 this year, which again, Elon's been late on this for the five, last five years, but if at some point they reach that, are Apple and Rivian really going to be that afraid to partner with Tesla to get their self-driving tech in the car? They're already, you know, they called out the Tesla supercharger partnership in this presentation, which for the R2 is extremely important because the R2 is going to sell probably two times to five times more than the R1S. One, you know, if you want Rivian to succeed, that's the kind of numbers you're looking at. For that kind of volume, you need a really good charging network. And jumping on the Tesla bandwagon obviously makes a lot of sense for them. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. This is, uh, you're very welcome. Yeah. I really appreciate that comment. That's my goal with everything. That's my goal with Tesla and Rivian. I've been in Tesla a lot longer. I still try to be unbiased. I know I have a bias. It's very hard for me to... Like, it's impossible for me to say I'm 100% unbiased. I don't think anyone is 100% unbiased, but I definitely try. And with your help, I, I really appreciate when you call me out when I'm not. <laughs> I read your comments and I really appreciate them. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll end it there. That was awesome. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed it, we want to support the channel. Links in the description. Congratulations, Rivian. Awesome day for, for Rivian. Everyone who works there, everybody who buys their products, everybody who's a fan. Super awesome, exciting stuff. Just to summarize, R2 begins deliveries, hopefully by the beginning of 2026, it starts at $45,000. You can put a $100 deposit at Rivian's website, rivian.com slash R2. They also unveiled an R3, which is a compact, looks like a compact car. We didn't get any details there. In my opinion, that's probably more for investors to feel like they're comfortable that the company is going to be around for a long time. And yeah, exciting stuff. If you love EVs, boy, was today an exciting day. Congrats again to Rivian. Congrats to everybody who works there. Keep going. Keep going. This is awesome. All right, everybody. Love you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.